title of the session is Free at Last, uh, which I hate. I, I'm not prepared to accept that title. Uh, <laughs> the title of the convention, yeah. however, is Brexit and the Political Crash, and that is a title that I really like because uh, I personally, I wrote a book uh, eight years ago after the financial crash of 2008 saying that there's bound to be a political transformation that comes out of this financial crash, as there was in the 1970s, before that in the 1930s, and before that in the 1850s. Uh, and out of that political transformation, we're going to get a transformation in the way that the economy is run. That part was right, but I certainly didn't expect either the political or the economic transformation to be anything like Brexit or Trump or any of the other phenomena that we're seeing around the world. So I think that the connection between the financial crash of, seven, of nine years ago now, the political crash that we're seeing all over the world, and the need for a transformation of our economic model is absolutely organic and inseparable. And that's really what we're here to discuss, how Brexit or non-Brexit is going to affect uh, the British economy and perhaps the European economy uh, over the rest of our lifetimes. Uh, to do that, we have, uh, unfortunately, Alice Enders had to drop out because she was unwell. Uh, we have uh, Will Hutton, the principal of Hartford College, uh, chairman of the Innovation Center. You, most of you will know him also as uh, a famous uh, best-selling author and a columnist on The Observer. Uh, we have Anne Pettifor, who's the uh, chairman of Prime Economics, an economic consulting company, uh, and she's really a, one, was one of the main movers in the uh, world debt relief uh, issue that uh, perhaps Bob was talking about earlier. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure whether he was. Uh, and we have John Mills, uh, chairman of a genuine business, uh, JML, a consumer goods company which sells household goods like uh, ironing board covers and feather dusters and things like that, a guy in the real economy, and also uh, uh, the chairman of uh, a labor group called Labor Future and a very prolific writer on what he sees as the problems of the British economy going back really right all the way back to the 1970s and 1980s. What we're going to do is each of the panelists will talk literally for just two or three minutes, giving their key bullet points about how they think Brexit uh, is going to affect the economy, and then we'll engage in a discussion. Uh, Will, we'll start with you, uh, then have John, and then Anne. Will. Well, the European Union remains and will, I think, continue to be uh, not just instrumentally a way of managing interdependence amongst the countries of the um, European Union, uh, but will carry on doing it around enlightenment principles which inform uh, the great freedoms, the regulations, the framework with which we manage interdependence on our continent. And uh, my view remains that uh, the uh, outlook is going, there's already a chill on the economy. Um, the property market, uh, you can see it, you can also see it with companies holding off investment as they worry about what will be the end game, what will be, uh, how will our relationship with Europe be managed in the future. I think that chill is going to become colder. I think it's going to become a freeze. I think there is no question we are going to fall off a cliff. Uh, the only question is how big that cliff will be. Um, whether you are, uh, you can talk about what's happening in property, potentially in Finance. There's that story. We'll talk about that in the next few minutes. There's also a story about what's going to happen on trade. There is no way that um, we can compensate quickly for the lost markets in Europe. Our exports will fall. Investment will uh, at best stay stable, at worst fall, and, and hard-pressed consumers will not spend. You can see it in sectors. You can see it in areas like overflying rights, uh, in Europe, you can see it in pharmaceuticals, you can see it uh, in a bunch of sectors, uh, and you can also see it in institutions, like will our high-tech startups get funds from the European Investment Bank? Put it all together, and I think the situation uh, 
is going to be extremely, extremely serious in 2018, 2019. John, you're, you're the token Brexiteer here. I know you disagree with that. Explain why that's wrong. Well, I think what we've just heard Will Hutton say was very reminiscent of what we were all told before the, rep the uh, referendum last June. Uh, and you may recall that the Treasury at the time said that the GDP was going to fall, not in 2017, in 2016, by the same amount that it fell in the 2008 crash. And I didn't believe that at the time, and I certainly don't believe that uh, what the, the gloomy prognosis that Will Hutton has put forward is the most likely thing to happen. Let me tell you what I think will happen. I think that the negotiations that the Britain, Britain's going to have with the uh, EU are going to finish up, broadly speaking, with one of two outcomes. Either we're going to get a deal in the two-year period allowed by Article 50, which would involve us coming out of the single market, out of the European economic area, out of the customs union, but with a free trade deal with Europe, which will give us most of what we've got already, or pretty well all of it, and therefore won't really affect the trade relations we have with Europe in relation to where we are now very much at all. Or what will happen is that there will be a standoff in which case possibly we'll still stay in the European economic area, but I think quite likely we will have a Brexit, hard Brexit, with the WTO option looming up. Now, you may think that that's going to be disastrous and we're going to fall off a cliff. I don't believe that's true at all. I think the reason why the economy did as well as it did after the 2016 referendum was because the pound fell from 145 to 125, and that's why exports have gone up, and why the economy is showing at least some signs of getting rebalanced. I think what had happened if you had a hard Brexit was the pound would fall by a further amount, maybe to a dollar or a dollar and five. And what would then happen is you'd get a resurgence of investment in this country, you'd get a substantial amount of uh, reindustrialization, the balance of payments would get in better shape, so would the government we reduce the amount of debt we're incurring all the time. But perhaps most important of all, what we would then do would be to get back a reasonable number of good, strong manufacturing jobs outside the South East and outside London to get our economy rebalanced, not only in economic terms, but also in social terms as well. And if everybody regards that as a disastrous scenario, all I can say is I really disagree with you. Great. Uh uh, thank you very much, John. I'll come back and challenge a number of those propositions. I may challenge one or two of Will's as well, but, uh, uh, but um, Anne, it's your turn now. Right, thank you very much. And what an impressive uh, gathering this yeah. is. Um, I voted to remain, and I voted very consciously for political reasons, not economic reasons. I believe in international cooperation, and I was shocked at the possibility of the breakup of Britain, which is what Bob has been talking about, quite rightly. I was also shocked at the recklessness, in the first place, of David Cameron calling a referendum. <laughs> Secondly, <laughs> and secondly, I think Remainers have to take responsibility, and especially the leadership of that campaign, hang on, for the way in which it was conducted. It was conducted viciously as a way of threatening and blackmailing uh, the British people with economic analysis and data. And much of that economic analysis and data was made up, was not based on reality, was based on ideological ideas. So I think the campaign was very badly run. The main architect of it has just uh, walked off the political stage, David Cameron, and the other, George Osborne has been evicted. Um, but he had plenty of allies in the, in the management of that campaign. And the thing that was most horrifying was the austerity budget that was threatened just a few days before by both Darling and Osborne. So there's, there's been problems on both sides here. But I want to say this. While I am a Remainer for political reasons, I also believe that the British people actually voted against something which is called globalization as a short-term term. And that is the utopian ideal harbored by many economists, politicians, and policymakers to remove the economy from regulatory democracy, to make sure that it is detached from any oversight by a parliament or, or, a demo or democratic institutions. Only that way, we've been told, 
can markets operate efficiently? Now, the market that is most effectively being detached from regulatory democracy is the financial market, of course. The financial market operates as if we don't exist. It operates as if there is no parliament, there are no democratic institutions. It operates out there in the international stratosphere. And that's where, for example, Apple parked £225 billion pounds of profits and evade taxation in countries like Britain. And what happened in 2010 was that the finance sector crashed this economy, crashed this economy, and the people who paid the price were not the people who live in this city or in the city of London. They were the rest, basically. And, and those people are very angry. They're very angry that they've had to bear the burden of adjustment since the crisis, while the 1% and the finance sector gets away with murder and is beyond their reach, and beyond the reach, if I may say so, of the political class. And that's why the political class is deemed to be so impotent. And that's why people are looking for alternative and other politicians, because the ones that messed this up in such a major way 10 years ago and cut, uh, cut incomes that are t today still 6% below what they were before the crisis, those are deemed to have not managed the economy in the interests of the British people. And I am critical of John in many ways, but I think it is right for politicians to turn the, the headlamps, if you like, the limelight onto the British economy and look at why it is so weak, why it has taken so long to recover, and why the burden of adjustment has, been to, has had to be uh, uh, burdened by the many and not the few. And, and in a sense, that's what Brexit is going to do. But my fear is that we have a government that, that pretends that that's what they want to do, that they care about that, uh, and talks about citizens of nowhere, but at the same time, simultaneously, talks about a global Britain. In other words, the global Britain, the, the, the utopian ambitions of those who believe in globalization are still embodied in our current government. And so we can't trust them to do what they say they're going to do, which is to care about the people of Britain and make sure that we survive this process and prosper. Thank That's you. That's great. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, and, that, and, that, and that really leads on to the, the uh, themes that I wanted to e examine in, in greater depth now and, and, c and come back to a number of the opening statements. Uh, and I think there are two really that John uh, outlined. One is you know, what is going to be the structure of the, new, uh, of the new relationship with Europe. But the other one, which I, I'd like to focus on first, is uh, assuming that actually we do have the uh, full-scale separation that the government is now officially uh, advancing, uh, who will be the gainers and who will be the losers in the UK economy uh, in sectoral terms, in regional terms, and I think also very importantly uh, in demographic, in age structure terms, because one of the most striking things about the Brexit vote is that it was essentially a vote by people over 55 to change the lives of people under 55 against their overwhelming wishes. Now, whether it turns out to be a good idea or not, there is no question that the older people in Britain, which includes, I fear, everybody on this panel, uh, although th that may not have be been the way we voted, uh, have a very, very different view as, as emerged certainly in the referendum and even in the polling today. Uh, if you look at voters under 55, there are more of them who are willing to vote Labour than vote Conservative, even with the Conservative landslide that we're looking towards. The reason there's going to be a Conservative landslide is because of voters over 55 overwhelmingly supporting the Conservative government and overwhelmingly supporting Brexit. So we do have, I think, this very interesting and potentially, I think, uh, rather uh, disconcerning and even perhaps uh, question, morally questionable demographic divide. But we also have the sectoral issue. Now, uh, John, said, so John said this is going to be beneficial for the manufacturing sector of the UK economy, but that will require 
a devaluation, as you said, of 10, 15 percent, assuming that we're outside the single market, outside the uh, outside any kind of free trade agreement in the short term. Doesn't that mean a big hit to the living standards, even of those manufacturing workers who will be getting jobs in the north of England, but at reduced real wages? Uh, the IFS has you know, predicted that in 2022, average real living standards will still be lower after Brexit than they were before the financial crisis of 2007. This is a worse performance than we saw in Britain in the 1930s. Uh, you know, doesn't devaluation actually mean a loss of income for the working people? It can't possibly do. And I'll tell you why. Because if, as a result of a devaluation, you have the economy growing more quickly and the population stays the same as it was before, and you divide the new GDP, by the, which is higher, by the same number of people as you had before, GDP per head has to go up. But leaving that on one side, if you look at the figures for all the devaluations that have been since World War II, and there have been plenty of them, what you find is exactly the opposite to what you've said. If the economy starts growing more rapidly, you have higher real wages for everybody who's working in the economy, but particularly in the manufacturing sector. So I think your premise is wrong, and therefore you, you're in danger of drawing the wrong conclusion. But not relative to the rest of the world, and that's the point. No, of what about an, we already have an economy that's pretty much at full employment. Can we actually raise our living standards by reducing the value of the pound relative to every other currency in the world, including particularly... We already know that you're wrong. I mean, we know that... Uh, <laughs> we, we, this is, and this is before the next devaluation that you want, because you want a further devaluation from $1.25 to $1.05, you were saying in your presentation. We already know uh, that house prices are slipping, we already know that consumer spending is flat. We already know that actually the big retailers are suffering falling sales, if not stagnant sales. We, we, we know the effect is, and it's just beginning for God's sake. If you have a further round of this time, we, we, we're looking forward to three and a half to 4% inflation towards the end of this year. We know that wages are going to grow at substantially less than that. I mean, my concern would be in your scenario that because of the squeeze in real incomes, because of the, uh, the, the, the uh, and because of the Bank of England's concern about the exchange rate slipping, a having a further devaluatory leg, it would raise interest rates. And I think the interaction of uh, a, a rise in interest rates and the squeeze on real incomes will fall, will lead to a substantial setback in the residential property market and even bigger setback in the commercial property market. And you don't need to follow me on this. The, the great big commercial property funds are holding a fifth or more now of their portfolio in cash. People who know what's up know which way is up are actually already acting uh, with their um, checkbooks and actually abstaining from the kinds of things that you think are going to happen. Um, I rest my case. And I'd like to ask you another question, which I, I think in some ways you probably uh, agree with uh, part of the structure of what John's saying, which is why I want to bring it back to you. Now, what John is saying really is that there, there could be a big revival in manufacturing employment but in an economy where basically everybody, you know, nearly everybody who wants a job mm. already has a job, what that actually means is that there would be a shift of employment, of economic activity to the manufacturing sector from the financial sector, which is something that I think mm. both of you would welcome. Yeah. But doesn't actually that mean a reduction in living standards? Look, because, the, because the financial sector jobs, the service sector jobs, the arts jobs, the architecture jobs actually generate much higher income than people working on an assembly line. I, I agree with you that it's unlikely to happen, and because you failed to mention, Will, the, the very low levels of investment that are here. The reason why we have low productivity, low paid jobs, and low skilled jobs is because we have very low levels of investment. And what it requires, it requires you know, positive action, in my view, by government to raise levels of investment, and that's not going to happen. 
And so this transformation away from finance towards manufacturing or towards anything else that's going to make us A, productive, and B, produce goods and services that we can sell to balance our external budget, our external deficit, now, that's not going to happen because of the, 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 the structural weaknesses of this economy. And John, you're not, aside from devaluation, you haven't got any answers as to how we're going to restructure this economy and incentivize those, uh, our own financiers, to invest in, you know, modernizing the economy and upgrading it. Now, well, Theresa May talks about an industrial policy, and, and that's, I think, what uh, Anne's talking about. I imagine you also believe in that, but do you see any signs of a constructive industrial policy from this government? Well, I think the problem is that it's very difficult to get manufacturing industry back to this country unless you have an exchange rate which is lower than we've got at the moment. But I think if you did, you would then get a very substantial amount of investment in that area which would lift the amount of investment in the economy as a whole, which we badly need. Going back to what Will was saying about inflation, just go back to 1992. I remember John Major was the Prime Minister at the time making a speech, I think, in Manchester, telling us how exactly what Will Hutton said was going to happen would occur if we left the exchange rate mechanism, which we were in at the time. We then devalued by about 15%. And what actually happened? Inflation went down. Inflation in 1991 was about 5%. By 1993, it was about 1%. And what happened next? The economy expanded for the next 15 years. So the idea that by reducing the exchange rate, you produce the Armageddon that Will Hutton has just described really is absolute nonsense. It's not what the history books show. No, let, let, just before we go back to that, though, I think the industrial, I'd, I'd like to just uh, you know, put you a little more on the industrial policy question. I think what you're saying, and I agree with this, is that a big devaluation of the exchange rate is a necessary condition. No. Is it a sufficient condition, or no. do you also need these other things that Anne was talking about? Very definitely you yeah. will. You need, you need better education and training, you need better infrastructure. In particular, if you look at the experience of the Japanese economy after the war, for example, one of the reasons why it was so successful, it did have a very competitive exchange rate, was because the targeting done by the Bank of Japan at the time was very deliberately to make it very easy for manufacturing businesses to borrow large sums of money. And I think that's the sort of thing now, we need to do in this country. And the problem is, what are the chances of any of that happening in the political environment that we now have in this country? Well, if I could just answer that question, I think uh, one of the please. things that's happened as a result of Brexit is that people are now prepared to look at more radical solutions than they were before. And I do think that the uh, industrial strategies have now come back on the horizon. And if I think, I pers my personal view is if we had uh, the demand side sorted out with a lower pound, and you did all these supply side things that the industrial strategy is all about, we really could get the economy to rebalance and to grow much more rapidly. And I think now, that's what we ought to be doing. But, but in theory, uh, let, let's say we accept John's uh, position in principle, but in practice, under the government that we now have, which is almost certainly going to be re-elected with a larger majority, can you see any of those structural supply-side industrial policy things actually happening under the, under the Theresa May government in the next five years? Well. well, a green paper was published by the government on industrial strategy uh, earlier in the spring, and it had 10 headings under which you know, we should group our thinking. I mean, all virtuous things, transport, training, infrastructure, science, R&D. Uh, and they're very, very good headings. But when you looked um, beyond the first paragraph, you looked uh, in vain for how that was going to, how those categories were going to be populated. Uh, but I, you know, I think that <laughs> events will force their hand. But whether they'll force their hand as wholeheartedly as needs to be forced, I doubt. But I want to come back to this point about um, if you're, I mean, it's a very kind of. 1950 view of the economy, John. I mean, I, you know, in 2017, manufacturing jobs only 10% only of the workforce. I mean, it takes a fraction of the numbers of people now to make a car or uh, ingot of steel compared with even 25 years ago. And that's not, manufacturing jobs like you imagine them are not going to come back. The, the jobs actually are in you know, business services, the fourth industrial revolution. And actually, these startup companies need a continental market to sell into, which is not what they're going to have. Yeah. They're going to. 
OK, well, that... No, no, I'm just going to finish this. I must finish this. Yeah, 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 sure. We are, we are living through, in this sense, one of the most kind of destructive acts of self-harm a, a major trading nation has ever, ever undertaken. Even someone like Christopher Booker, who's been campaigning to leave the European Union, says we must, must avoid with every breath in our body, a hard Brexit. We must stay inside the European economic area. We must stay in the single market. We must stay in the customs union. We must accept the jurisdiction of the European court. And if that means that we have to have freedom of movement, so it must be. He argues that, but what's actually going to happen, and it is because Theresa May is so adamantine about controlling borders and ending freedom of movement. We cannot stay inside the European economic area. We therefore have to have a hard Brexit. We therefore have to kind of have this strange, muddy, extraordinary world that no member of the World Trade Organization has ever had to kind of go through of leaving one trading block to establish yourself as a lone trading country when the rules of the WTO oblige you to be members of a trading block or not. We, it's the uncertainty, even if you have have the devaluation that you're calling for will mean people with, will withhold this crucial investment. It is, you know, we're sailing towards a cliff. It's not talked about enough. It needs to be said with more urgency and more passion. Exactly. Well, <laughs> well, uh, well, uh, Yeah. So I, I was actually going to raise the same challenge, although with less passion, uh, uh, to to John, because I, I think I one of the statements. On, no, no, no. Me. One of the statements statements you made, John, in your introduction, was manifestly false, and that was you said, well, we have two options. One is that we'll get out of the single market, we'll get out of the customs union, we'll get out of the EA, and then we'll have a free trade agreement which will leave us essentially trading in exactly, or more or less exactly the same way as yep. we are today. This is manifestly false. It is a lie for exactly the reason that will outline, because the vast majority of the British economy is not affected by tariffs, it's not affected by free, uh, free trade deals, it is affected by the membership of the single market in exactly the way that Will described. And moreover, that is the only growing part of the British economy. The shrinking part of the British economy is the one that's affected by agricultural tariffs and manufacturing and so on. So the question is this, do you really believe that actually the, the kind of hard Brexit that Will passionately describes and uh, Theresa May very boringly describes, we'll, you know, we'll get out, we won't have freedom of movement, we won't recognize the European rules, we won't pay anything to the budget, but of course we'll continue to trade. How can you state that that is true? Because that doesn't, that means that our financial services can't operate in Europe, it means our pharmaceutical companies can't operate in Europe, it means our architects can't operate in Europe, it means our media and visual uh, 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 technology companies can't operate on the same uh, uh, basis as they do today in Europe. So how can you say that this will change nothing? Well. My day job is running a business which ships about 2,000 containers a year all over the world. Yeah. We sell everywhere. I think 85 countries at the last count. So I know quite a lot about what trading is all about. Manufacturing uh, goods. This, you don't know anything about what trading in business and, you know, audiovisual Well, services. with all respect, right. I do know quite a bit about yeah. this because I'm involved in that as well. Oh, okay, and I can't see that. any reason why we're going to have enormous difficulties in selling into the single market on the same sort of basis as we do at the moment. I'm because sure they'll the say you're not allowed be... in. They'll say you're are a bank really based in Britain, say... you can't do business here. Uh, are they really going to say you're not yeah. allowed to design that building? Yes. No, of course they won't. Yes. They've course, said it. They've said it already. But, uh, Anatole, how can it be? How can it be in that case that most of the trade the European Union does is with countries that aren't in the European Union at all? Because They're in the World not, Trading Organization. It, does very it doesn't little. stop America. Wait a minute. It doesn't stop America selling loads of films and services It'll and all be. sorts of things yeah. to, the, okay. to, the, to, okay. to the European Union. Same with China. Same with India. The idea that you have to be in the single market to trade with the single market is a complete fallacy. Yeah. Um, well. Um, and, and you had some comments. Can I, 
can I disagree with both of my colleagues yeah. here? And then, um, and then we're going to turn it over to the audience. Yes, <laughs> I mean, I want to say this, which is that I think the arrogance of the British government in assuming that we can negotiate anything but a hard Brexit is extraordinary. The way in which we are treating our European partners when all the cards are in their hands shows how we still live in this imperialist dream of ours. And it's delusional. <laughs> But that's not my point. My point is that another weakness of the Remain campaign is this extraordinary emphasis on trade. And John is just as at fault in saying that the thing that really matters above all else is just the exchange rate. Now, I'm not denying that trade is important, and I'm not denying that trade with the European uh, uh, Union is incredibly important. But actually, there's a lot more to be done because we face an even greater threat than the threat of leaving the European Union, and that is the threat of climate change. Yeah. And we need to re-equip and restructure and re-refit uh, our economy to deal with that, which requires us to do an awful lot domestically. We need to build flood defences. We are an island surrounded by rising waters. We have old Victorian properties that leak like crazy and are extraordinarily energy inefficient. We are dependent on strangers and will be dependent on strangers for our energy supplies. So there's a lot of work to be done here. So the fact that our manufacturing sector right now is weak is a function of the dominance of our finance sector if we alter that balance. But if we also begin to focus on what's really important and that is to prote protect the, the security of the British people in the long term, that will mean an expansion of jobs and investment in climate change, uh, technology, whatever, in the next period. And so I, don't, I think you're wrong, and I think the Remainers have been wrong to say the whole thing is just about trade. Yeah. There's just far too much emphasis on that. Okay, I, I think I'd like to open it, open it up to the floor. Uh, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but I can't resist supplementing uh, w what you said, Anne, I, uh, which I fully agree. The problem with that argument is that many of the same people who argued against the so-called expert opinion on the economics of Brexit are precisely the same people who deny the existence of climate change. That's true. And they do it on exactly the same basis. They say, oh, well, this summer actually was a bit cooler than last summer, <laughs> and therefore climate, this is exactly the same argument, saying, oh, well, the Treasury was wrong about the 2016 forecast, no. therefore yeah. Brexit will have no economic effect. <laughs> yes, sir, we're going to have three questions and then, uh, or, all right, four questions, and then, th then we'll go back to the panel. Thank you, Chair. Martin Reed, Labour, in a personal capacity. First and fundamentally, we need another Brexit referendum, like the plague, I would say. You know, at least the two major parties have avoided that divisive pitfall. Indeed, Labour's rehash... Can we have questions, no speeches? Oh, right. Sorry. Well, I think, you know, we need to... The, the hypocritical pseudo-progressives should show some humility. That certainly would be a change for the better. Does the panel agree? Thank you. Uh, one more there, and then we'll have two there. I didn't get it. Does the panel believe uh, that Brexit is to the benefit of the 1% in this country? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if it doesn't believe that 1% will benefit from Brexit, then do you think that Brexit will still happen? Mm -hmm. That's a good, very interesting question. And then we'll have two from there and each you'll give a quick answer, yeah. I'm Patrick Lowline from the Kent Export Club, Chairman. Um, I'd just like to ask John Mills a question. Um, what you were saying about the manufacturing sector, do you think that uh, applies equally to large and small companies? Uh, because the composition of the British economy is such that we actually have a large number of very small manufacturers who have uh, clients all over the European Union. Now, what's going to happen after, the European, after we leave is that each of the, these companies will have to de deal with a tax man in each of these countries individually. Now, for a big company like yours, that's not a problem. You've got accountants. You can afford to have a bank account there. You can have a, afford to have yeah. a tax advisor in every single country. These small companies that I know, these companies that apply 25 people, they have no chance of doing that. Thanks. Great. Uh, and one more question. Then. Yeah. yeah. Darren Kiggins, Napo Branch, Essex. Um, I'm quite interested in the economic analysis for exporting. You want a low pound, but you forget we've also got to import 
they'll go up. Where's the competitiveness on that? You've got a second one. You want to, your model seems to indicate that there will be less money for people to spend. So people are going to come here and invest when there's no one going to buy your product? Is that what you think? And second, thirdly, startup yeah. costs for companies is always greater than an established company. They have greater costs. Where are you going to get the competitiveness to start up these companies? Thank you. Thank you very much. OK, uh, l l we'll go to the same order, John, Will and Anne. You don't well, have to answer all the questions, no, whichever ones you want. No, I can answer the yeah. particular questions. The easy ones. <laughs> yes. I mean, I, I think that if you have a lower pound, it makes it much easier to sell abroad. I've got a load of experience that that's the case. Unfortunately, most of the products that uh, JBL, the company I built up, sells come from China because we can get them made there at about 50% cheaper than they are in the UK. I wish it was different, but that's the, been the situation we've been in, unfortunately, for a long period of time. But if you do have a lower pound, it then becomes much easier. And I must say, the idea that it's particularly difficult to start a company up, or more difficult, if you've got a bigger export market because you've got a more competitive product to sell there, is a completely at variance with all my experience. I, my experience is that the whole of the world for goods is extremely competitive, even quite small difference in price make a lot of difference to where people go to get the goods produced. And I think we've lost out very, very heavily of manufacturing because we haven't allowed this to happen here. We've lost the productivity gains in manufacturing. We've lost the good jobs. We've run an enormous balance of payments deficit. So I think that we'd be far better off if we had a more competitive pound. Well, well um, referenda, look, I think that um, when the deal uh, such as it is, and it will involve us having to write a very, very big check um, in order to get uh, mild uh, concessions fr from our former partners in the European Union, and will have lived through and be facing uh, stagnation ahead. M in my view, this should be put to another referendum. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, so, uh, and, and those people who are shouting me down, had the result of the referendum in June last year been the other way round, would be pressing for a second referendum just as hard now. Yeah. You can be sure of that. The reason why you don't want to entertain it is because there is a very high prospect of losing it. The, yes. That is, in that case, let's have it, um, if you're so confident. Uh, the one, the one percent question. I, to tell the truth, I think the 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 top. It's not so much the top one percent; it's the top 0.1 percent. And they, there's a curious thing going on here. Actually, um, they'll probably be okay. Whatever. Tell the truth. Um, uh, some of the luxury houses uh, in central London have uh, the market has seized up, and they're not particular. They'll, they're almost they're going to be as unhappy as a manufacturing district like uh, kind of Sunderland, when Nissan actually freezes and pulls out. The, you may find that a very extraordinary coalitions emerging um, to win the referendum that we'll have undoubtedly in 2020, as this country reassesses what it wants to do in the light of the catastrophe through which it will be living. Um. I, I don't have much to add that I completely agree that it must be a central demand of the Remainers now for a second referendum. We must absolutely demand that. Secondly, I, I, I've had moments when I've thought that Brexit won't happen at all, um, and, and because it's all just too awful, but I may just be uh, delusional. And I'm not sure whether or not... Uh, and I agree with Will that the 1% will look after themselves, so really um, they won't determine it. But a second referendum should be a central demand from this, this hall and from this movement as of now. Right. Uh, good. Uh, I, I, I'll just answer one question. Is Brexit to the benefit of the 1%? I think Will's absolutely right. The top 1% or the top half a percent, it's neither here nor there. Uh, they are citizens of the world. I would say we are. I am a citizen of the world. It really doesn't matter to me. The question is who is going to suffer most from Brexit. Yeah. 
and that, I think, is unquestionably going to be the bottom 50%. Uh, no, 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 the bankers are doing fine. The bankers are doing fine. Their income is in dollars and euros, and I assure you that most of them are better off now than they were a year ago. 15% uh, better off, actually. Uh, <laughs> they're, they're, they're mostly my clients. Uh, but uh, but <laughs> the bottom 50% will suffer, and I think that's the, that's the tragedy of it. We'll have two questions there, and then two questions there, and then we have to round it off, sorry. Okay, thank you very much for this debate. It was very interesting okay. to see, especially because I'm a student. Um, in my opinion, one of the main things that Brexit or the people who voted for Brexit helped to solve, uh, hoped to solve, was income and wealth inequalities and especially the system not working for the average Joe. And this is not something that I think will be solved no matter what deal Britain, Britain yeah. can achieve from Brexit. Yeah. So Look. shouldn't we spend more time um, helping to, uh, m helping make people understand what tax means and how the system is not working because so many companies, large companies, are avoiding tax and they are relocating yeah. their profits and yeah. so on from one region to another. Great. Thanks. Thank That's you. one for you, Anne, yeah. I think. Uh, another question there and the two there. And for you. Um, you obviously all care about the economy, but after Brexit, is the economy the most important thing to work out in negotiations or are other things, such mm -hmm. as the social situation, more important? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. And then two from there. Make one point and ask a couple of questions. So my one point Just is... Just two questions, Okay, right. we do not have full employment. We have 1.6 million people unemployed yeah, yeah. and 1.7 million people claiming tax credits. But mm -hmm. our unemployment levels are nothing compared to some other European countries. Is talking about employment or unemployment as one country just a bit too narrow Good because question. really what we've got is a technological yeah. revolution, a gig economy that is amassing capital in the hands of the very few and isn't that a bigger and wider issue but also part of the reason that this vote has happened. People are knee-jerking to that because they feel powerless. Great. Good question. Thank you. Very similar to the previous question. Good question. Uh, for John Mills, I'm not an economist. I'm a CEO of a small company in South London employing about 15 people, the factories in India. On 23rd of June, the Indian currency was trading at 100 rupees to a pound. We were smooth, smooth sailing. On the 24th, it fell to 88 rupees to a pound. Hmm. We sat back. Today, it's 80 rupees to a pound, 20% drop. What do I get? 3% price increase. 31st of March, we closed our books. We are barely even there. We have been a wonderful company paying taxes. National average says inflation is 2.3%. I can't pay my employees, not even 1%. Okay? Now, this is fallacy or myth or reality. John Mills. Thank you number very two. much. No, number two, important no, no, question. Well, right, very quickly, because yeah, we're, we're going to be pounded off the stage. You, you <laughs> send the goods from here to Paris. It's nine pounds by UPS. You send the same thing to EEA countries, it's 17 pounds and three days wait because of the administrative processes. What do you say, John Mills? Thank you. Right. Mm -hmm. Very quickly, we'll start with Anne. We'll do them in reverse. Mm -hmm. John, you'll get the last word. Okay. <laughs> so I, yeah, want to, I want to agree with the two questioners and, and Anna Toll and say it is the bottom 50% who are going to suffer and absolutely that we should focus on improving their living standards and their opportunities of A, finding a roof over their heads, B, being able to get higher education, C, being able to have the living standards that the elderly have enjoyed. Now, the point is that if we don't do that, if we think Brexit and Donald Trump and Marine Le Pen are insurrections that are dangerous, wait for the next insurrection. If people feel that they have really been done down, by this Brexit process. The anger is going to be immense and it's going to be more dangerous. It's going to flow into the, into the far right, in my view, uh, much more than it has already. So I fear what's going to happen after Donald Trump. I fear what's going to happen politically after Brexit. And so therefore, I, you're absolutely right that we should be focusing on improving living standards and opportunities for our people but I don't think that our government is going to do that. I think they're being reckless about that. And, and I therefore feel that, and, and can I say that it's not the technological revolution that, that has caused us to have low levels of very insecure, 
uh, precarious type em employment. It's really the, the, the financial crisis, and it's the fact that we've never fully recovered from the financial crisis. And the financial crisis is still causing volatility in, in the global economy. The central banks are pumping out $500 billion a and, quarter, yep. and still the economy can't recover. But the banks are benefiting from that liquidity, and those who own assets. So really, we need to be, we need to be realistic about what the real problems are. Well, I have two quick points. Um, I mean, just on the first question, of course, uh, we really have to get better at, um, better at the whole business of um, jobs and wealth generation in Britain than we are, and especially in those parts of the country which you know, feel they're no longer part of the national story. And I think that's an important reason why they voted the way they did, along with the plethora of gig economy jobs and all the rest of it. Actually, uh, and you, uh, you, you know, I'm not in disagreement with you, but the spearhead of that is without doubt going to be these major technologies that are coming towards us um, in the next kind of 20, 30 years. On this point about is it only economics, you're absolutely right. Uh, I, want, uh, I want to stay in the European Union, like Ian McEwan, I'm a denier. Um, uh, and if we can't, I want the very closest relationship we can have with them. They are our partners on our continent. Uh, citizenship rights of our nationals and their nationals are fundamentally important. For example, the rights of our students to be able to go on Erasmus programs and all around our continent, fundamentally important. <laughs> Accepting fundamental tenets of what it means to live in a democratic society in our times, rule of law, respect for the European Court and European Court of Human Rights, a whole bunch of things that are, are as important as how we make our living from day to day. But this is an economic panel, and that's why I talked about the economy. <laughs> well, can, can I preface my closing remarks by saying I do agree with Will that uh, one thing we do want to do is to maintain the important relationships we've got with our European partners on a whole range of things, including everything from, I don't know, defence procurement to terrorism to education and all these other things. And I think we could do that. But going on to the specific questions I was, was asked, perhaps I could preface it by saying uh, it, it, it's difficult to envisage just how enormously this country is divided. Let me give you one statistic. The gross value added per employee in London is £44,000 a year. Yes. The figure for the North East is 19000 It's less than half. That's how enormous the divide is. And hardly surprising in those circumstances, you've got sort of an enormous welling up of discontent, which I'm sure was a lot to do with the Brexit vote that took place. But going back to what you were saying about whether reindustrialization is any solution to this problem, I think it's worth recording that 8% of our employees produce 10% of, of our GDP in industrial output. Wages and productivity is 25% higher in manufacturing on average than it is right across the whole of the rest of the economy. So the idea that what you're doing is going for sweatshop jobs and all the rest of it is completely wrong. Finally, just on the question of trading, it is true that if you have free movement of goods like we have at the moment, that is a slightly less complicated way of bridging intercontinental government intercountry transfers than having either free trade or indeed a tariff basis. The paperwork is a little bit more complicated, but I'll tell you, as somebody who deals with this paperwork all the time, it isn't that difficult to do it. And I don't think that that's any kind of barrier to allowing companies, small companies in this country to, to get going. So my vision of the future is that the very worst of what's going to happen is we're going to finish up more or less where we started off. But I think at best we could do a great deal better. Okay, well, thank you very much. We're, we're, we're being chased off the stage. I can't resist saying just a sentence in summary. I think in the last round of questions, we really got to the nub of the issues. There were questions on income distribution, social issues, uh, regional inequalities. These were unquestionably the motivations behind the Brexit vote. But they were not on the ballot paper of the referendum, and they are not and the government is doing its utmost to ensure that they are not on the ballot paper on June the 8th. So the issue is this. 
there were all kinds of questions that people up and down the country are asking about income distribution, inequality, regional issues, training, productivity. These are the questions, but is Brexit really the answer to those questions? And I think, manifestly, it is not. Uh, I think, even John, you believe that devaluation is the answer. You don't think that deregulation and the kind of uh, Jacob Rees-Mogg economy is no, the answer. I don't know. Right. Well, then we're agreed. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>